All right, well, good evening. Uh, welcome back again. This is lesson number three. I'd like for you to turn in your notes, if you would, to uh, page 13. Um, at the bottom is where we left off. We were talking yesterday uh, in our last class about uh, Joshua and the message in Hebrews and how they are both are parallel truths. They were written in different dispensations and obviously they were written to different audiences. The audience that Joshua was writing to was very different than the audience that the writer of Hebrews was communicating with. But the truths are very, very similar. For Hebrews, I think that the message is very self-evident and I think it's a great message. It's one of those messages that every one of us as believers need to really take to heart that we cannot take Christ lightly. We cannot treat Christ indifferently or superficially. Uh, and it is this long-term uh, uh, and abiding indifference and superficiality regarding a person's commitment to Christ, his commitment, uh, their commitment to his word, to his church, and all that kind of stuff. That in my mind, it's just a personal opinion at this point, that in some ways reveals that that person may not actually be saved. Uh, you can't just treat Christ indifferently for years and years and years and treat, and treat Christ's church and his word and indifferently. There are a lot of Christians, uh, there are a lot of professing Christians, they, they, they don't even bring a Bible to church. You know, you, you almost have to beg them to bring a Bible. If they don't bring a Bible to church, my, my opinion would be that they probably don't ever open or read their Bible at home to any degree. They might have a little 10 minute devotion, something of that nature, I don't know, but I, I really wouldn't feel comfortable with that. Why? Because when a person has been saved, there's something that that salvation does in them. It's something that it does for them. God works in them in a supernatural way to give them a new heart, to give them uh, uh, new desires. And when you just never see that, when you just simply never see that taking place in a person's life, it, you, you at least have to reflect on it. You have to be willing to address it in, in somebody's life. And I think the testimony of Scripture is clear. When, whenever God's people go astray, that he, he will discipline them. In Hebrews chapter 12, it states the reality of this truth. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But... If you are without chastening. You know, this is one of those verses. Uh, to me, this is one of those cornerstone verses that address uh, the reality of a person's salvation. If somebody can just live in sin. I, I know of uh, I know of some people now that in my mind, they profess to be Christians. They're living in sin. And... Uh, I, I'm just waiting to see if there's going to be any discipline in their life. I don't know if there will be or if they won't be. But I just don't think that you can abide in sin over an extended period of time, profess to be a Christian, know that it's sin, know that what you're doing is way outside of the boundaries of God's Word, and there not be any discipline. Because God says here that if you're without chastening, if you're without dis discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate, and he says very clearly that you are not sons. So one of the ways that you can evaluate often is whether or not somebody has ever really experienced God's discipline. Now, if, if, if you personally have experienced God's discipline in your life, then you know what I'm talking about. If you've stepped outside of his boundaries, you know, I, uh, I know I've mentioned this in some of the other courses, but God disciplined me literally for 12 years. Now, that's a long time. I don't think I understood. Let me back up. Probably of that 12 years, I would say six of those years that I was under God's discipline uh, because uh, I just went out and did what I wanted to do. Um, uh, left one church. This is when I was just a young Christian. It really didn't have much sense about me. 
went off and uh, left a, a really good church, went and started a church and uh, with some other guys and uh, it just was not a good situation. And, I, and after a period of time, I realized that I had really made a very serious mistake. And the Lord just simply would not let me leave. He just would not let me leave where I was. I mean, I knew that. I, I wasn't going to make the mistake again. I prayed about it. I was, I, I, I was, uh, I was spent a great deal of time in God's Word. I was teaching several times a week. I, I just, but it was a long time. It was a long time. I've never made that mistake since, and I'm not going to make it again. And the discipline was hard. It was, I, did, I never enjoyed it, you know. There are different kinds of discipline. But uh, if, if you don't have any, when you're outside of the boundaries of God, it means that you are illegitimate and not actually God's son. I wouldn't be too impatient with people if God doesn't discipline them immediately. Uh, that's a good thing for all of us that God doesn't just discipline us immediately. He gives us time to kind of what I could call to self-correct. There, there have been plenty of times in all of our lives when we've been outside of God's will. We know that. We understand that. And God's given us some time. He's given us the option of being able to, what I, can, what I call to self-correct my life. That's a good thing. The Holy Spirit's working. The Word's working. Uh, in, in us and, and we just make the corrections that we need to and get right back in alignment with God's Word. But for those people that never self-correct, um, you know, God's going to give them the opportunity and if they don't do it, that eventually He is going to discipline. So I think the message here is very simple. Even though God is extremely loving and He's extremely patient with us, He's long-suffering, all of those kind of things, there's a limit as to how far He will allow a believer to live in sin without any kind of consequence. If we take the history of Israel, if there was anything that you learn from the prophets, it's that God was long-suffering, it's that God was patient. Uh, I mean, these kind of things went on for years, decades really, uh, before God actually uh, actually disciplined them severely at, at, at the end there. But Scripture does not define what that limit will be. And I don't want to test that limit. I hope that you don't want to test that limit. This is not something that I want to just, just, uh, just was, well, how far will God go in His patience? And how far will God go in His long suffering in my life? I think that you ought to be grateful that every time that you fail, that God does not discipline you. But to balance all of that out, Scripture does teach that if a believer continues to live in sin, that God's discipline and God's chastening is something that is inevitable. It, in a, in a, we could almost say it's inescapable if we don't make the self-corrections. Uh, so in some cases, the discipline may simply be that a believer, that God allows a believer to have what they want. I've said that so many times, that one of the worst things that God can do to you is just to let you have your way. It's just to let just just just, just to let you have what you want. That would be the clear message of, of Romans chapter one, where God just gave them over. It just says, obviously I don't think the people he's talking about there in Romans chapter one are, are necessarily believers in that context. But by the same token, I think that the, the principle is still fairly simple there is that the worst thing that God can do is, is to let me do my own thing, is to let me do what I want to. Sin has its own built-in kind of consequence to it. And so, um, I think that was the discipline that we see there in Romans chapter 1, where God says that they, He actually gave them up to live as they chose to live and ultimately suffer the consequences. And in many cases, that may be exactly what God does to you, or what God does to me. He just he lets me eat the fruit of my ways. He lets me, uh, uh, you know, my sin just 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 goes to its normal consequence, and um, uh, he he just you know our life becomes fruitless. Uh, we don't have any peace. We don't have any assurance. Psalm eighty one says, "My people would not heed my voice." And Israel would have none of me, so I just gave them over. I gave them over to their own stubborn heart to walk in their own counsels. I think that's exactly what I'm 
trying to communicate here and trying to st- to say is there there may be a time when God just says okay you, do, you can do whatever you want to you don't want to come to church you don't want to study your Bible uh, you don't want to be kind to people you 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 feel like you have to just speak your mind on on uh, on everything that 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 comes about I had uh, somebody just recently that came to me and uh, and uh, and they were kind of uh, agitated about something uh, nothing serious it wasn't I mean it, it wasn't anything what I would consider to be some kind of major issue in their life but some people had done some things to them and and uh, they they had just so one of the statements that this individual made to me they, they said well I, I just have to get this off my chest and they kind of said it like that. I, this, this is just something I got to get off of my chest. And I'm, I'm thinking, well, I'm, I'm not really sure that that's the right biblical answer. That that whenever I don't like something, when something doesn't go my way, that I just got, that I just have to go speak my mind, say what it is that I want to say, just get it off of my chest. I don't, I don't see that that's the biblical pattern at all. I see the biblical pattern is uh, that I'm to be. Uh, uh, kind to people. I'm to be uh, tender-hearted. I'm to be long-suffering. Um, uh, I just don't think that every time that something doesn't go my way, that I've got to go out and spout off what I don't like about it. And yet, that's what a lot of people do. One of the problems that will occur if that, if if you develop that as a pattern in your life, is that is that it, it, you you it, if you create an issue. In your life, right, let's just say something happens, and you just go and make an issue of it. it. Once you make an issue of it, that issue has got to be resolved. And I can assure you, uh, from a lot of exp- personal experience, that that issue is not necessarily going to be resolved the way that you like it. Uh, people are going to be offended. Uh, things may not work out the right way. Uh, we, I have this sort of a rule that I just uh, constantly teach to my church. I say it over and over. Uh, you know, they, they're probably tired of hearing me, but I just say, where there's no wood, the fire goes out. It's a proverb. And just don't keep fueling the fire. Just walk away from some things. Uh, there, there, there are some issues that you need to contend with. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying don't make an issue of everything because once you make an issue of it, then it has to have some resolution, and you may not like the resolution. You know, uh, William, who's in the in the class here, uh, we've talked a lot about being a pastor and what it means to be a pastor, and uh, and uh, and I, I I've, I've said to him very often, I said, uh, you know, we as pastors, we we've got to decide what hill we want to die on. We've got to decide what sword we want to fall on, and and. Uh, that's just not a that's not a hill I want to die on. I'll give you an example. Um, uh, uh, every time Easter comes around, you know, we we, we have kids and uh, we have some of our uh, uh, ladies that work with the uh, the children in the children's church and everything, and they 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 make these little eggs, these little Easter eggs, and they put toys and candy in them and they hide them outside, and they'll have a little 15, 20 minute egg hunt outside. Well, I'm not really not in favor of that. I don't. I don't. I don't think that's a, a uh, something that is. Uh, I just, you know, Astarte and all the all that kind of stuff that surrounds Easter. But it's just not a hill I'm going to die on. I, I'm I'm not going to fall on that sword. It's not a big issue to me. Uh, the intent is good. The kids don't know the difference. We don't worship. We don't worship. We don't have a pagan spirituality here. Uh, we, we, we don't mention Astarte. The Easter egg hunt means nothing to us. Now somebody may, it may be a big deal to them. and They may make an issue of it in their church. The next thing you know, they've got tension and people upset and all that kind of stuff. You just have to determine what issues you're going, what, what, what wars you're going to fight, if, if that's the way to put it. And that's just not one of them for me. It's just whether they sing two songs or three songs, it's, it's not an issue to me. It's just not something that I'm going to worry about. Um, and I think that all of us would, could, you know, we could learn from that. So the intent in all this is not to frighten somebody or to threaten anyone. I mean, why should a believer be afraid of Christ? 
I mean, when we come to Hebrews and we have these warnings, that's, that's the whole point of what I'm saying is that God is not, He's not given the warnings to frighten us, to make us feel, uh, obviously they should make us feel a little uncomfortable if, if we're outside of God's, of God's boundaries. But the exhortation is very simple in that every one of us needs to recognize the spiritual truth that consistently making wrong spiritual choices that demean the person of Christ have unquantifiable consequences to them. Let's take, a, let's just say that a, a, a young couple in your church decides that they're going to live together, uh, and they're not, uh, they're not married, and so they're going to go live together with one another, and and yet they profess the name of Christ. Well, in my mind, what they are doing is that they are trampling underfoot they, they, they would they would literally fall right into Hebrews chapter 10 there where it talks about it talks about trampling the son of God underfoot and counting the blood of the covenant that's something that is sacred treating is it as if it's profane marriage is sacred the marriage bed is sacred you know uh, it says a little bit later that there in Hebrews chapter 12 that the marriage bed is undefiled and, and, uh, and yet they're just treating these things that they know are outside of God's boundaries lightly, indifferently. Uh, it, it obviously would affect their relationship to other believers and that church should discipline them. Uh, I, would, I wouldn't have any problem uh, confronting somebody, following through with Matthew 18, all of that kind of stuff. But they, I don't know what the consequences are. I don't know how to quantify what those consequences might be in somebody's life. I think it would be a little frivolous on my part. It would be a little uh, assuming on my part to say that I know what the consequences are. I know some instances in a case like that and uh, where uh, a couple went off and, uh, and uh, violated, you know, both of them said that they were Christians. They went off and... and uh, um, uh, lived together, moved away, went into another city, and then, and then uh, lived together. And the next thing you know, uh, uh, the girl is pregnant, and uh, they move back, and, uh, and and it's not. It's just it's just a short time after that they're divorced. And and I mean I don't know what the consequences are, but now they've got a child. They they they're separated. They don't have a marriage. They did everything wrong. God let them have what they wanted. And the discipline, I think, is very, very severe in those kind of cases. So generally, when one of the New Testament writers, like Paul, when he would compose a letter, like, let's just say, Romans or Ephesians, it, it would begin with a very, very strong doctrinal section. You know, if you go back and you study Romans, uh, I know William is teaching in Romans now, and uh, I've made Romans my life work, but other than probably the exhortation that's given there in chapter five, um, chapter 6 about don't let sin reign in your mortal body, don't present your members as instruments of unrighteousness, that the, the next exhortation doesn't come really until chapter 12. So, and then you've got chapter 9, 10, and 11 which talk about the sovereignty of God. You've got the first eight chapters that deal with being justified by faith. And chapter 8, which is probably the greatest chapter in all the Word of God on the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. I mean, it's just all doctrine. It's just doctrine, doctrine, doctrine. And then it actually comes to the, to the exhortation to live out the Christian faith based on those doctrines. It was an especially strong distinctive of how Paul presented his information. And uh, that's, that's certainly true here in Hebrews. It's all doctrine until we get to chapter 12. And uh, when he used that pattern, when Paul used that pattern, one of the things that he was doing was operating under a very important spiritual principle. I want you to listen very carefully. It's, name, it, it's namely that living an effective Christian life is dependent on the great doctrines of Scripture. I would say to you that if you're a pastor, if you're a teacher, if you have a Sunday school class, if you're in some kind of ministry, 
that probably the one thing that you need to consider as much as anything else is that you in some way systematically teach doctrine in your church or to your people. Because, the Christ, because doctrine is the foundation of the Christian life. If you don't understand the doctrines, and especially the doctrine of Christ, I, I have found, I found personally, uh, I've been teaching doctrine in my church for probably, I mean, just pure doctrine for almost 10 years. And uh, I found of all the doctrines that I thought might have been the easiest, that the doctrine of God was the most difficult for me to teach. Uh, I mean, how do you talk about God? How do you how do you how do you put His omniscience and omnipresence and His sovereignty and all those kind of things in into perspective and make it practical? But it's just absolutely absolutely crucial. And certainly, the doctrine of Christ. I think if I if I was going to teach uh, anything about Christ. Hebrews would be the book where I would start to do that. That would be the doctrinal section of Scripture that you may want to start in. But you have to teach all of the major doctrines of Scripture. If I were to ask you to make a list, of just write, let's write down a, a listing of all the major doctrines that we would study. I teach a, I teach a three-semester course on systematic theology. And uh, one of the first things that we do in the class, I teach it and I've, I've taught it here in uh, the, our local extension and I, I teach it in Romania. Um, it's a three semester class and one of the first things I ask the men to do or the students to do is to write down uh, what they consider to be um, the major doctrines of scripture. And I'm, I'm always a little stunned at how at how little they understand what the major doctrines are. I mean, there it's obvious. There's some that are just obvious. Okay. I mean, if we said we got the doctrine of good, uh, God, I would say that you really you have to start as much with the doctrine of just the Bible, uh, just the Word of God itself. But you got the doctrine of God, the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, the doctrine of sin, the doctrine of salvation, the doctrine of angels, the doctrine of the church, the doctrine of the Christian life, it just goes on and on. There, there's probably 15 major doctrines that you, and then you can take some of those and break them down into things like the sovereignty of God, the incarnation, uh, the atonement uh, would be a major one. Um, uh, it, it just you've got to have a good understanding of those things and for people that are not rooted and grounded you know I look I, 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 I don't say this arrogantly uh, just please forgive me adjust it if it sounds wrong but when I look at the majority of Christians say that are in my church that have been sitting under doctrinal teaching for a long time I, for the most part they're, they're all fairly mature they they can uh, they understand the scriptures. They can uh, they could debate with you on different issues. Uh, debate probably not a right word. They could dialogue and communicate with somebody uh, on major issues. I think they would certainly know what to say in leading somebody to Christ. Um, they 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 have good strong families. They're teaching their kids. And I think all of that's related to doctrine. And yet you can go to some other churches, I've been involved in them, and, 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 and you never study doctrine, and the Christians in those churches normally are very weak. They don't have a, because, because they're, they don't, they're, not, they're, they're not grounded in certain doctrines. I, I think doctrine is much more difficult to teach. It's much more difficult to to te it's a little more cerebral. You have to think about it more. You have to, you have to work at it. It's, it's, you can't just, it doesn't, uh, in, in a lot of cases, uh, trying to figure out how to apply something. Let's take, say, the doctrine of the incarnation. How do you apply that? Uh, you know, when Christ became the God-man, what, what is the, how does that apply to my life? I would say that for me, that the incarnation and the sovereignty of God are the two most important doctrines in Scripture, bar none. I would include the atonement in those, that, that work of Christ, and that's certainly what we're going to look at here in, 
in, in, in Hebrews, but the sovereignty of God is just a governing principle. It's just a governing doctrine. And if you don't understand that, then you're not going to, your life, uh, you're, you're going to struggle in your Christian life. And if you don't understand the doctrine of Christ, you're going to struggle. You're not going to follow Him. You're not going to be, you're not going to be consistently uh, committed to Him and to, and to His ways and to, and to who He is. And so, these, you know, this, the, it, it's like, uh, if, if, if these things are true, then this is how you and I are, are to live. So in reviewing Hebrews, I think there's a very similar pattern, but it's, it's, it has an obvious difference. There's this great doctrine, this tremendous doctrine on the exaltation of Christ. It's about the high priestly ministry of Christ. You'll see that as we go through this in the next couple semesters. And it permeates everything that the author is writing everything it just saturates it's just like it's just like filling a sponge with water it just gets saturated with it and that theme that theme of the high priestly ministry of Christ of exalting Christ now you just have to think about this for a minute because these Christians are being persecuted these Christians are living under intense suffering they many of them have lost everything I mean that's the historical record of what has taken place with these Christians and how much they have lost in their life. And 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 you would just think, well, the the the, the guy that's writing this, their pastor, whoever he was, that he was he was he'd be trying to encourage them how to get through all that. And he has a few verses on it. Uh, there's not a lot. Uh, he he actually warns them more about falling away than he does uh, th th then he actually encourages them in, in, in the opposite direction. I find that to be, you know, when I, I've studied this now for such a long time, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm still kind of stunned by that. Because that's what we do. We see a problem, so we go out and address the problem. You know, uh, somebody's struggling, so we go over there and we kind of give them some advice and some counsel and we try to help them in that particular area. It's like going to the doctor, you know. They hardly ever treat the, the cause of what has happened to you. They, they, they just, they just uh, treat the symptom. And that's what we kind of do in Christianity. We're always just treating the symptom. And, 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 but what's in, what this writer does is that he, he just keeps exalting Christ. He just keeps lifting Christ up. He just keeps taking his person and his work and placing it before those people and, and there are difficult things going on, and he just keeps exalting Christ in that. Now, if you're, if you're a good student, if you're somebody that's worthy of the salt that you're, that you're uh, uh, preaching from and teaching, then you ought to pick up on that. You, you ought to just see that somehow as you read through, as you meditate on, on these passages. And so... These exhortations and this, the, the, the doctrines, they're just kind of interwoven into one another. If you went to Ephesians, first three chapters on the church, and the next three chapters are the practical exhortations of it. Uh, if, you know, uh, but it's not that way in this book. It, it, it's very, very different from the way that Paul kind of addresses the other books. That's why. Uh, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of people who think Paul wrote this. I, you know, uh, who knows? Who knows? It's, it's not even good for us to speculate. Uh, God doesn't tell us, so we're not, so we're not going to worry about it. But I know that Paul addressed that when he writes in a lot of his other books, letters, not necessarily all of them, but he, he's very doctrinal to begin with, and then he has very practical exhortation. It's very seldom, I'm not saying that he doesn't at times, it's very seldom that he integrates the two. He may have an exhortation in a section, but for the most part, if you went through and you and you just marked in your Bible, sort of like I do, the exhortations in a in a book, uh, the imperative commands, whatever they are, you, you'll find that most of them are separated into a different section. It's not that way in Hebrews. It's just not that way. Everything is kind of integrated until we get until the last chapter and a half, until 
till he comes there and then it's just like he's just kind of running out of time and he just tells us a lot of things that we ought to do and they're kind of connected you'll see that when we get to Hebrews chapter 13 that's a long time from now though so there are there are large sections of scripture on the person of Christ if you just took Hebrews chapter 1 that's an example and it's it's generally following them there are some immediate exhortations and warnings as associated with what the writer has to say. That's why there's so many therefores through the document. There are actually 28 therefores. Uh, you know, the way that I, I say it is that you got to ask, you know, what's the therefore therefore? But one of the things that we know about a therefore is that it's always pointing us back to what's been said. Every time that you read a therefore, like if you go to chapter 2, verse 1, therefore, well, he's given this this great exaltation of the person of Christ talks about his throne, calls him God, and he says, therefore, you've you, you got to give earnest heed. And so what he's, the exhortation is based on the doctrine that he's providing there in, in chapter 1. And so there are approximately 16 specific teachings, specific different teachings throughout this book that exalt the person of Christ. There are over 40 specific exhortations, and that does not include the warnings. So once again, it's important to see how the author actually views what he's written and what he sees as the primary purpose of his letter. He says in chapter 13, verse 22, right there at the end, I appeal to you, brethren, bear with the word of exhortation. And I don't think that he's talking there about the final exhortation that he's giving them in chapter in chapter 13. There are 25 verses in chapter 13. There are 21 exhortations in that. Nine of those are in the imperative tense. So uh, he's talking about this entire letter. It's his word of exhortation to them. Um, and so uh, the, the particular word there for exhortation is the Greek word periklesis from where we get the word uh, paraclete. It, it's the word that's used for the Holy Spirit, someone that comes alongside to, to help you and to comfort you. And it's an intensely intimate word. And when it's translated to represent the Holy Spirit, it's sometimes translated as comforter. So you just got to think about this. He said, I appeal to you, brethren, bear with this word of comfort, uh, this exhortation that I'm, that I'm giving to you. So the purpose of Hebrews is intended to bring about great comfort and great encouragement to the readers. They're not words that are designed to frighten them. There are a lot of Christians, when they get to the warnings, they, the warnings frighten them. You know what the warnings do for me? Let's just take one. Let's take one and say in chapter 3, verse 12, uh, just, you can turn your Bibles there. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. Well, I'm encouraged by that. And you're going to say, well, why are you encouraged by that, Gary? Well, the reason that I'm encouraged by that is because, because I, I don't have a, a, a heart of unbelief. I open God's Word, begin to read it, and say, man, this is, this is what God has for my life. I'm, I'm not, I don't have any intention of departing from the living God. I don't believe that my heart's just getting hard through the deceitfulness of sin because I'm living in open sin. So I read those verses and I, and I just go, you know, if you read verse 14, we've become partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, I'm going, man, I've been a Christian for 43 years. I'm still holding tight. You know, I, so I'm encouraged by all those things. And I think that they're intended to be an encouragement to somebody that really is following Christ and somebody that is not... Somebody that's not, I mean, if you're living in sin and you're, you're, you, you, you don't believe a word of thing God says, that you're going to be departing from the living God. And you need to be very careful. But that, I don't think that's his intent here. And so, I, there are some words of strong reproof here uh, and correction. Uh, there are and, and, and there should be. There should be. Uh, you could take this as kind of a, a reproof if, if you want it. I think the reason that the writer's writing those kind of things is because he sees that those things are actually happening in the congregation, in the fellowship, whatever it is, in the believers that he's associated with. And so the consequences 
once again, um, if, if, the, if, if, if these believers have understood the author's amazing teaching and exaltation of Christ, uh, uh, then the personal consequences of their decisions have strong ramifications. I would say good or bad. I wouldn't just limit it to, to, to bad things. The consequences here in Hebrews, this is very important. We'll talk about this in some detail as we begin to open up and, and finally get to the scriptures here, is that you cannot quantify what the consequences are. I'm going to keep saying that over and over. And the way that I'm going to say it to you as we go through the study is that, is that, is that you're not going to lose your salvation, but you are going to lose something. I don't know what that is. I can guess. I can surmise. I can assume. I can make some uh, assumptions. But I don't know exactly what it is that somebody may lose, what I may lose. The following, I think, uh, is the magnitude of the consequences in Hebrews. And it should be observed that they're more general in nature than definitive. You can follow along there as I read them. The consequences are that a believer might drift away in Hebrews chapter 2. That they may not escape in Hebrews 2 and Hebrews 12. That their hearts may become hard. That they may fall. That they may find it impossible to be renewed again to repentance. And that they may experience some form of punishment there in Hebrews chapter 10. That's it. That's it. But for me, it's, it's still impossible to actually know how to quantify the magnitude, the actual magnitude of the consequences with just those few statements. Uh, you, you might could add a few more to it. Uh, that'd be fine. But I'm just making the point that the writer doesn't tell us what the consequences are of not following Christ. He just says that there are consequences. And he doesn't necessarily give us a great deal of definition as to what those consequences are. Often I have to travel, uh, I have to go to uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. And uh, I have to travel on I-40. We leave, uh, we go up to Asheville and then we go over to Knoxville on I-40 there in North Carolina. And if you've ever been there, they have a lot of rock slides, uh, They've got uh, you're riding along where they cut out through the mountain, and they've got they've got these wire, uh, really stiff cables and wire stretched across the rock because the rock will fall. Uh, oftentimes, uh, I, several years ago, the, the the had a tremendous rock slide. People got killed in it, and uh, it took a year and a half for them to open the road back up. Uh, it was a very very and the, the, the road is very curvy, it goes through the mountains, it's got a couple tunnels uh, in it, and uh, uh, it's a, it's a four-lane road, you know, got a median in the middle and all that kind of stuff. And they have a lot of uh, very important speed limit signs. The trucks go up and down that road. It's, a, it's an interstate, it, there's sharp curves, there's steep inclines. But the warning signs, everybody listen, the warning signs, they just say steep, steep, uh, steep incline. They just say uh, sharp curve. They just say uh, uh, to slow down, speed limit. But none of those signs on that very kind of dangerous part and segment of the road is probably a an hour's worth of driving on there. That's very, very, I'm nervous every time I drive through there. None of the signs, not a single one of them, tell you what the consequences are going to be. It just says, watch out for falling rock. Well, I, I can imagine what a falling rock landing on top of my truck would do to it from, a, from way up, or what going too fast around a curve would do uh, uh, to me. So. Uh, that it just doesn't announce. It just tells you that you need to heed this warning. 
You need to do what this warning says. You need to slow down. Uh, you need you need to you 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 need to do something about the steep incline. Um, they have these runaway places where the trucks can run off if their if their brakes give out on the on the steep incline. So the signs only give the warnings. But what is clearly understood is that in every warning there is an implied danger that is part and parcel of that warning. It, it, they're telling you just because it's a yellow sign, it's it's got words on it. They're telling you that there is a danger that is ahead if you don't heed the warning. And that's exactly what the writer of Hebrews is doing. He wants his readers to understand that there are implied consequences with the warnings that he is giving. Uh, there are dangers in not heeding God's warnings for their life. How God actually administers his dis discipline is different for every person. You may be a wonderful Christian. You may, you may have been a pastor for 40 years. Uh, you probably, if you've been a pastor for 40 years, you probably wouldn't be taking this course. But let's say, let's say that you're a young person, uh, a young man, and you, you've, uh, you got a job, you got a family, you're going into the ministry, but you've been just a, a wonderful, a wonderful uh, a Christian brother uh, for all your life. Uh, William, who's here with me in, in the class, um, he's been a Christian almost all of his life. Been a wonderful Christian, has followed the Lord, has always uh, gone to church, uh, studied God's Word. He's very um, uh, conservative, very uh, um, knowledgeable of, of the Word of God. It's evident if you are around him. Uh, and so how God may discipline him may be very different than how God would discipline somebody that had been a Christian for the same amount of time, but had just always ignored God's Word, had been completely indifferent to it, just just uh, lived in sin, and had not done what God wanted. You know, how God is going to discipline an individual is up to God. And for me, just as a Christian, I think there are a lot of factors that enter into the kind of discipline that God will would would uh, would provide in somebody's life. Uh, I just think I just I think some people that the discipline wouldn't you know all of my children are different. I have three children. I have I have six grandkids, and all of them are different. Uh, you know, when I was growing up, my my oldest son re he responded to discipline just like that. I mean, just I, I could just look at him wrong. And uh, he would respond. He would be responsive. He would he would he would correct his life. Uh, uh, my daughter was stubborn as a rock. I mean, they're just two years apart, and she was just as stubborn. I I mean, I, I, you just you felt like she wasn't listening to you sometimes. And then my 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 third son, he was completely different. He was sort of in between them, you know. Uh, we're we're all different. And so the way that I disciplined one sometimes was a little different than how I disciplined somebody else. I mean, one of the other children. All my grandkids are different. Um, they're very different. I have, uh, I have one little grandson, and bless his heart, he just he struggles. He just really struggles. And uh, I, I have a, a granddaughter, and she's just, as, she's just as gracious and as passive and as obedient as she could possibly be. They're just night and day difference in them. I, I don't know why the differences are. You know, they come out of the same families. So how God might discipline somebody is based on what God knows it will take to correct that person's behavior. You know, I would, th I would hope, I would hope, I, I'm not going to say that I would, and I hope that you would. I, I would hope that if God had to discipline me in some way, that I, I would be very responsive to that, that it wouldn't take just weeks and weeks and, and months for God to get my attention on something. Uh, I, I, you know, if, if, I, if I was ugly with somebody and, and said something that I shouldn't have said, hopefully I won't do that, that it, it wouldn't take long for God to get my attention, to know that I had to go back, I had to seek somebody's forgiveness, I had to say what I needed to say. 
uh, I had to do what I, I had to do it in the right attitude. I needed to be Christ-like. You know, God's always developing Christ-likeness in us. Every circumstance that we have, He's always developing Christ-likeness in our life. So the writer is not challenging here. And I want us to appreciate that. He's not challenging every little sin that somebody may have committed in their life. He's not doing that at all. That's, that's just not... Every one of us sin every day, you know? Every, every single one of us. And uh, But he's he's... What he's challenging is what he sees in his congregation or whatever it is, these people that he's writing to, this tendency to move away from the things of God. Now, I've been a pastor long enough that I can see the tendency when somebody starts moving away from the things of God. You can just, you just see it. You know, they... they they don't pay attention in, in, in church much anymore. They fall asleep. Uh, sometimes when they fall asleep, I just get louder. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But, you know, they just, they just, uh, they just drift, you know. They, they used to come on Wednesday night. I, I remember a lady in my church, uh, uh, she, uh, I, I, I had led her to the Lord, uh, or, or thought I'd led her to the Lord, uh, years ago and and uh, for some reason just she was very faithful she came to every service uh, she, she was attentive she would ask questions and the next thing I know she just she's just kind of drifting and and uh, uh, I talked to her about it a couple times I just just tried to be pastoral in my relationship to her and next thing I know you know she's coming to church twice a week rather than three times a week. Next thing I know, she's only coming once a week. Next thing I know, she's, she's gone. She found something to complain about and she's gone. Well, it was something that I could see. I could see that that was the inevitable result of, 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 of whatever was going on in this, in this lady's life. And I think that that's what this writer sees. He sees this tendency that some of these people had that they were going to forsake Christ, which he obviously considered to be a very, very serious violation of Scripture. So Hebrews not only tells the believer that they have to press on, but it explains a little bit as to how that is to actually happen. Here's how you press on. See, now, the answer that I'm going to give you is not the answer that people want to hear. They want you to give them a set of rules. They want to give you, uh, you, know, you know, 14 things that they can do. And that's a good way. That's a very good way to, uh, 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 to diminish the endurance and perseverance of your people. It's just to give them... Do A, do B, do C. You know, A leads to B, B leads to C. That's great. That's great. I, I do that often, but not much. And the reason for that is, is because we press on through the surpassing greatness of Jesus Christ. Here's the way I say it. You can't be godly without God. You can't live the Christian life without Christ. And somehow... In the church age in which we live, that kind of idea of, of it is, it is foreign. It's too doctrinal for, for some people. And so every week it's about self-improvement, it's about self-help, it's about different things that you can do in your life. Listen, I, I, I'll say it again, I think I said it in one of the other studies, if uh, my people if, if, if they understand the doctrine of Christ, I don't have to worry about them too much. I don't have to worry about their walk and their, their relationship to Christ and their relationship to other believers and their faithfulness to the church and their commitment to the things of God and whether or not they, they have a heart for discipleship and for, and for evangelizing. I don't think I have to worry a great deal about that. If they understand Christ, if they understand the doctrine of Christ. But I think that we in the church, you know, I've said it this way, I, I may have said it earlier, is that I think there are a lot of people in the church that don't like Christ that much. 
it's like they've heard him all, about him all their life. They've heard all the stories and all the Bible stories and in the Gospels, and and they're just kind of bored. And so they want you to give them something else. My tendency is is I just want to give them Christ. I, I'm not saying that in a superficial way. But I want them to understand Christ. I want to keep pressing that issue. That they have to develop and maintain a personal relationship with Christ. I have a I'm very I'm very structured in my life. I'm very structured in how I go about my day. I, I'm a I'm a note guy. I, I I I take notes. I have I have notebooks. I have multiple notebooks of different kinds. I have journals. I, I get up in the morning early. I study. I, I mean, I just read, uh, and I'm, I'm constantly writing down. Uh, just, I mean, I have so many notebooks hanging around my house of things that God is just teaching me, of questions that I have, of all of that. Uh, for years and years and years, I've had uh, a, 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 just a, a, a prayer listing of people that I pray for, of missionaries that I pray for, of things for my church, of my elders, uh, of the people in my church, of uh, the pastors that I'm associated with, of my students. Uh, just, uh, just, uh, a pr I just something that every day that I know that I this is what I'm going to spend my time on. And but part of all of that is that is that every day I spend time in God's Word, and I want to draw close to Christ. I want to draw close to Christ. I want Him to speak to me. I want the Holy Spirit to be talking to me from His Word. And, and, and because that is where I gain my strength. It's not that I say, well, okay, I have, to, I have to read this much in the Bible every day. And I have to pray this long. And uh, I have to go to church on Wednesday night. It's not that at all. Uh, you know, if, if, if you approach ministry that way, you're gonna. You're just gonna have a bunch of clones, uh, and I think in the ultimate, in in the end, that your ministry will not be that effective. Why? Because you have to be doctrinal. Uh, I say you have to be. You should be doctrinal in your content. Yes, we. Pastor Gary, I think it's kind of what you're saying is uh, that in Hebrews they lift up the writer lifts up. Christ in spite of their difficulties and Paul did the same thing in Romans chapter 5 he said we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ we have access into grace something in which we can stand on we rejoice in hope of the glory of God and then he does the same thing and not only this we exalt in our tribulations hmm. so the greater our view of Christ really the smaller our problems no matter if there's death no matter what and James I think would say the same thing yeah. So I think we do our people. No, that's a great point. It's a great parallel. A great disservice when we we always want to get out of the problems. We always want to do everything we can. And I, I mean, we're sympathetic and mm -hmm. uh, certainly with our Absolutely. people with ISIS and throughout. Mm -hmm. the, I mean, something like that where they're losing their lives. We're, I mean, we certainly have compassion, and nobody wants to see that. But at the same time, when we understand who we are in Christ, how great He is, what all He's done for us. We can even glory in our tribulations, and, it, and that's what Paul tells us to do. Writer of Hebrews, James. Amen. I mean, I mean, that's a that's a great parallel. I mean, what Paul is saying there in Romans five, because he's had he's had four chapters of just pure doctrine about being justified by faith and having peace with God, and and uh, he makes the parallel there. Just I think in probably the same way that this author does. Right. And he gives the next exhortation there in chapter 6, but from there on it's still doctrinal, you know, especially 6 and 7 and Holy Spirit and 8. It's a great point, great point. I haven't seen that, but I think that's a very, a very good parallel there. So our point is, is, that we, is that we press on through the surpassing greatness of Christ. It's not in our own strength. It's not in our own energy. If we're left up to our own resources, we are in trouble we're in trouble we're not we're, we're going to have trouble living the Christian life apart from Christ and so they press on in the same way that those in Hebrews 11 pressed, uh, pressed on will will get to that great chapter by faith in Hebrews 11 the term by faith is used 18 different times in that passage and everything in the Christian life has got to find it's it's got to be grounded uh, the decisions that I make, my lifestyle, 
uh, how I utilize my resources, uh, uh, how I expend my time, uh, the focus of my life, the goals of my life, all of those things have got to be founded and grounded in something that's solid. It has to be in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And, and I'm going to say to you, just in, in a general way, it ought to be obvious, it ought to be evident, it ought to be something that you already know in your heart. You ought to go, yes, uh, when I say this, but, but Christ is the only foundation that we have. The Word of God, obviously, but everything is built around Christ. Everything in the Christian life is built around Christ the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And the more that you say, if you're in a place of ministry, the more that you exalt the person of Christ. I, I'm not, you know, it's not like every week you got to preach out of the Gospels. You know, it's not that at all. There, this, the whole New Testament it exalts Christ. You go to somewhere like Colossians chapter 1, my goodness. Uh, you know, it's, that's an, 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 and chapter 2, those are two amazing chapters on Christ. Um, and, and the work uh, uh, William's just talking about in, in, in Romans, it's, it's about his work. It's about the work of Christ. I mean, it's, it's faith in something. In, in reality, it's faith in someone. And, 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 but the, my, my, my point is, the statement I want to say is that the more that you personally, in your ministry, find a way to exalt the person of Christ, the more people are going to be drawn to Christ. If you get into all of this kind of cultural Christianity that we have, of uh, you know trying to help meet people's felt needs and and all of that kind of stuff and all of this. Um, uh, entertainment mentality that we have, uh, you're going to find very quickly that your people are going to fall out of love with Christ and not in love with Christ. They're going to be in love with the church. They're going to be in love with the ministry. They're going to be in love with, with what, the, what God can do for them. And uh, you just have a very, uh, a very uh, wrong foundation. The foundation is the person of Christ. You can't go wrong. You can't go wrong if you exalt the person of Christ. And so, it's something that has to be appropriated by faith in your life. If you want to grow spiritually, then you must understand that that personal growth depends on this ongoing dependence on the person of Christ. It, I mean, it's, I, I don't even know how, how to say that sometimes in a practical way. It's just something that you have to work out in your own life. You, 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 you have to work out that part of your salvation. Of how do I depend on Christ? It may be different for you. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a morning person. I'm an early riser. Uh, I, like, uh, I like studying late at night. I'm, I'm a, I, I love it's quiet. The phone's not ringing. You know, the grandkids aren't coming into the house. It's, it's, I'm not distracted. Uh, uh, you know, my, you know, my study in my home is in a different part, and I can be quiet back there. Uh, I mean, everybody has to work out how you're going to do all of this in in, in your life. How how are you going to depend on Christ? My, you know, what, one of the things that I do is that is that every time, every chapter that I read, when I get up in the morning and I read through. The Old Test parts of the Old Testament and the New Testament, and I do that, and I have my I have my pen in my hand. I have a, my notebook right there, right beside my Bible as I'm reading. I read really, really slow. Uh, every Sunday at our church, uh, we read we read scripture. We read a lot of scripture. We read several chapters, uh, anywhere from two to three chapters every every week, at least two to three chapters. There are times when if I get to a small book like Philippians, we'll read through the whole book. Or a book like Colossians, we just systematically are going through the New Testament. We just start over again, go through the New Testament. It's amazing how, how, how much you can read just in church on a Sunday morning or on a Wednesday night. And uh, 
but I read really, really slow. I'm never in a hurry to get through God's Word, ever. There's some parts that I, I mean, if I'm at a genealogy, <laughs> I may approach that a little bit differently, but for the rest of it, I'm, I'm reading through it very slowly. I'm asking God as I sit down to, Lord, I want you to teach me. I want you to speak to me. I want your encouragement. I, I want you to exhort me. I want you to correct me. Please help me, O oh Holy Spirit. Just come and help me. You've got to work all of that in your own life. You have to figure out how that works out in a practical way in your life. I can't tell you how to do that. Let me say it this way. I don't want to tell you how to do that. You, I, you know, I could give you a personal testimony of what I do in my life, but it's just, it's just works for me. If I went and talked to Dr. Sullivan, he does it a different way. If I talk to Brett Sullivan or Dr. Il Defonso who teaches courses or Dr. Uh, Craven, you know, one of those guys, they all do it differently than me. That's fine. That's great. I, it doesn't matter. But I know what I do know is that they all maintain this meaningful personal time, this relationship that they have with Christ. And it's divorced, if I can use that word, it's divorced from, from being a pastor or, or being a, uh, a president of a school. All those men are, are uh, pastors in churches. And it's divorced from that. I don't get up in the morning and study and, and read through the scriptures so that I personally can get something that I'm going to give my church on Sunday morning or Wednesday night. It, it, that, I'm not doing it. That, I, it, it has, that's, that's a completely different area of my life. It's a completely different time. It, I study completely differently than that. There, there are certainly times when God's teaching me something and it comes out of me when I'm teaching. But I'm not doing it for them. I'm doing it for me. I'm doing it so that I can have a relationship with Christ. I'm not doing it so that I can, oh, that's great, now I can teach this. Uh, it's very rarely that I, that I just take something from my own personal devotions and put it into the message. Because God's talking to me, He's building things in, into me. And he has, you have to do the same thing. It's something that has to work in your life. Um, we live in an age of easy believism, cheap grace, spiritual lukewarmness, and it's essential that if you're going to be a committed believer, that you have to appreciate that there are no shortcuts to having and maintaining an abiding and personal relationship with the person of Christ. There's no shortcuts to it. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes concentration. You have to be cerebral about it. You have, to, you have to know what you're doing. You have to know how to approach it. You have to be faithful in it. There's no, there's no substitute for being faithful and being committed to something in your life when it comes to your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so the exhortation in Hebrews is just don't drift away. Don't drift away. Uh, from the things of God. Don't, don't let your heart get hard. Don't, you know, hold your confidence steadfast to the end. Be diligent to enter into the rest that God has provided to you. Hold fast your confession. Come boldly to the throne of grace. Those are things that you, at a personal level, have to integrate into your life, and that's what the author is saying to these people. It's almost like these people, in some ways, and obviously you may, if you're preaching on a Sunday, uh, I, I have a rule that I, I live and die by in the pulpit, and that is that if, if let's say, for instance, I'm studying and I come to a place and I, and I think to myself, man, this really applies to that person. So I start writing my notes, you know, and I, I, I'm, 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 I'm thinking about John Doe here. And I've got, and, and man, he really needs to hear this. Uh, he's way outside the boundaries of what God wants for his life. And I start writing that stuff down. I never do that. Ever. Never. In fact, in fact the rule that I live and die by is that, is that I, that's what I take out of my message. Now, I know that there are plenty of things 
like that that are just general and they apply to everybody that's in the congregation, not just John Doe. But if I've got him specifically in mind, Sister Susie over there, and I, and I, I, and I, and I just say, man, this, this is for her, and I, I begin to write that down or something, I scratch it out. I don't type it in. I, it's, I, I'm done. Why? Because I am not going to replace the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit in this church. It's not going to happen. I'm not going to take His place. I'm just going to teach His Word. If it applies to you, great. If it doesn't apply to you, wonderful. But I'm just going to teach it. And I'm not going to begin to try to make the application for somebody that I know that, that needs it. What would I do? He said, well, well, what if they really need it? Well, what would I do? I'm their pastor. I would go to them, and I would talk to them about that particular area of their life. I do that all the time. I have a relationship with my people where I can talk to them about their personal spiritual walk. I have one brother in the church that he just, uh, he just struggles at times with different areas of his life. And uh, he'll call me, we'll talk, and I, I'll communicate to him very clearly <laughs> the essential things that he needs to know in his life. There have been plenty of times where I've reproved him, I've corrected him. Um, uh, he, he, just, uh, he just takes it and, 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 and applies it to his life. It's good. But I don't ever preach at him in a service. Ever. Ever. Am I, am I directing something to him uh, because of uh, an area of his life? Never. It just it never happens. I want the Holy Spirit to do that work, not me. I'm not the Holy Spirit, and I'm not going to take his place, and neither do you. You don't need to do that. So if you'll notice here in Hebrews chapter 6, you'll see there in the middle of the page on, verse, on, on page 16, Hebrews 6, 17 through 19 says, That's God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation. Well, why do I have strong consolation? Well, there are these immutable things, there's these things that aren't going to change. One is that God can't lie. So whenever I come to the Word of God and he gives me instruction out of his Word, it works. You know, that's, you know, I, I was, uh, I was preaching not long ago, I don't know how long ago it was, probably a month ago or something, and, and, I, and I remember a part of the message, I got to the end, and I said, you know, the one thing that I've learned about the Christian life is that it works. It works. It's, it's, so, it's not, it's not like I'm trying to always figure it out. I'm not always trying to, well, what have, what have I got to do next, or how does this work? It's like, just do what you know God says to do. Just do it. If uh, uh, we, uh, I had a, a person that, I've I mentioned this verse several times, I'm, I'll, I'll mention it again, it's just on my mind. Uh, I was in Romania recently, uh, just uh, uh, a, a week and a half ago or so, and, and, uh, and one of the people that I was, uh, that I was uh, ministering to, uh, they... I, I sensed in our conversation that there were these, there were these, um, uh, a, a root of bitterness that was in their life. And so I went to him and, and, and uh, I talked to him about it. It says uh, in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Well, how do you grieve him? Well, it says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, be put away from you with all malice, you know, and there was just this bitterness, and then it says, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And we just had a long conversation that evening. I mean, it was a long conversation. It probably lasted for an hour at least on just those verses right there. And the verses in uh, Hebrews chapter, what is it, chapter 12 about not being bitter. And so, is it 12? Uh, I should know, excuse me. Uh, that all bitterness, yes, falling short of the grace of God and any root of bitterness springing up in you. And 
But I said, listen, you have to do what God says. He says, you, you put away bitterness and you put on tenderness, forgiveness, being kind. That's what you do. Now just go do that. And what you're going to find is that it works. That's, that's, that's God's instruction for your life. That's God's instruction for my life. Why? It's an immutable thing. It's God cannot lie. He's not going to just, just give you some information here, but it doesn't work. You know, it kind of works some of the time. It, you know, uh, uh, it really doesn't apply to you. You're the exception today. No, 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 no. It works all the time. The Christian life works. Isn't that good news? That ought to be good news for every single one of us that handle God's Word. And then he says, who we have fled to for refuge to lay hold of this hope that is set before us, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. So we have this amazing hope, we have this strong consolation, but it's still something that every one of us, notice the word there, you have to lay hold of it. You have to lay hold of this hope. You have to lay hold of this strong consolation that God has given to us. The writer says it here, it's the believer's refuge. It's a refuge. And it's both sure and it's steadfast. And it's, it's, it's this hope and this confidence uh, that's a part of their inheritance. But they still have to lay hold of it. I have to lay hold of it. You have to lay hold of it. And that's why there's such a large exhortation, I think, in Hebrews 11, 11 that we are to live by faith. The Christian is to live by faith. The ESV in the Amplified Bible translates Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18 this way. Listen carefully. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong, uh, strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope that's set before us. The Amplified says, This was so that by two unchangeable things, His promise and His oath in which it is impossible for God ever to prove false or deceive us, we who have fled to Him for refuge might have mighty indwelling strength and strong encouragement to grasp and hold fast the hope appointed for us and set before us. And that's what you and I have to do. We have to, we have to figure out what it is that Christ has done for us and given to us, and we have to hold on to that. We have to grasp that. We have to hold fast to that particular truth. Now, there are two major types of passages here in Hebrews. Number one is that there are those passages that deal with the exaltations of Christ, and there are those passages that exhort us. I think uh, some commentators would, would include uh, the warnings. It's a major part. But the warnings are just normally just one or two verses. They're not like... Um, they're not like long doctrinal teachings on, on an area. I would include the warnings as an exhortation. That's just a personal thing. It, you, you, can, you can divide it differently if you want to. It's not, a, it's not a critical thing. But in my mind, there's the exaltations of Christ, and then there, there, there are the exhortations that come from, from, that, exert, uh, from that exaltation. And they are just interwoven, that you can't divorce them from one another. Uh, he exalts Christ in such a way that it's always demanding from us that we follow Him, that we be committed to Him. And it's because of who Christ is that the readers here are exhorted to persevere in their faithfulness. They are uh, to persevere in their fervent appeal uh, that has produced the theological tension in the letter. And, and, and that's, a, that's a really a great point here, is that what the warnings do is that they create this tension in the letter. Uh, you, if you read any of the commentaries, I probably have 25 or 30 on them, if, 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 and that's not counting the electronic forms, 
if you read if, if if you read it there is this tension that's created by it's almost like these warnings uh, chapter 3 chapter 6 chapter 10 chapter 12 chapter 2 they all they they all create when you're reading along and you're like well this is really great and all of a sudden you come to this warning and it creates this tension in the letter so the pattern here is that the writer integrates, inter, intersperses these exhortations within the doctrinal teachings on Christ. And I just want to repeat, I'm, I'm repeating myself here. I think it's important, it's important uh, to understand this overall context of Hebrews before we ever get into it, is that, is that he intersperses those, uh, he, he takes the doctrine and the exhortations and kind of joins them joins them together. And I think one of the reasons why the writer probably does this is to help the reader with the warnings. I think, I think that's why he does it. So that they don't get frightened by the warnings. He's just, he's always, you'll find that surrounding the warnings that there's always this exhortation, uh, uh, these, these positive exhortations that should be an encouragement to, to the person that's actually reading them. So, without any question, uh, without any question, I wouldn't argue this uh, for a second. The warnings are the most difficult part of the book to deal with. Let me, let me back up. I think the most difficult part to deal with is Melchizedek. I think that when we get to Melchizedek in chapter seven, uh, that he is he is a very very mysterious figure in the scriptures and uh, it's quite a challenge to, to, to go through that chapter when when we get there but the warnings are probably from the overall perspective the most difficult portion of the book and the exaltations are the richest and probably the most honoring of Christ found anywhere in the New Testament so the exaltations and the warnings just cannot be divorced from one another. Just, just imagine for a moment. I want you just to think for a moment. If, if, if you've read through this, hopefully by the time that we get through the course that you will have read the book of Hebrews, right? But I think that it would be, it would be an extremely difficult book if what had happened is that if the writer had just given us just let's just say for the first nine to ten chapters he had just given to us all he had done is just exalt Christ just exalt Christ just exalt Christ every 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 chapter just exalt Christ just exalt Christ and then when we get to chapter 10 or chapter 11 he gives us all, he just goes into the, all of these warnings, these strong warnings. And somehow, in, in my mind, that would have been completely inappropriate uh, to just kind of consolidate all of them. He kind of intersperses them throughout. There's a little crescendo effect. It gets stronger as we get toward the end. But if you just waited to the end and just, just kind of pounded down and this, this warning and you can't do this and you shouldn't do that, I think, I think it really would have made people very uncomfortable. But he doesn't do that at all. Um, uh, I, I think these people, if he had approached that letter, they, they, they're going through some very difficult circumstances. I think it would have been tremendously hard on them to have, for him to have approached the letter in that way. I think they would have felt a little bit overwhelmed. If you put all six of these of these warnings together in one place they could be overwhelming and and so he's just kind of casually interspersed them throughout the I mean almost every couple chapters he's he's had one he just sort of builds it up I think that's intentional I think if you don't see that if you don't appreciate that that you're probably just not paying attention to how how this book is actually written and so he presents a picture of Christ and then he gives a warning and he exhorts you a, a little bit and then he gives a picture of Christ a large picture of Christ and then he, he gives a warning and then 
exhorts you a little bit, and then he gives you another picture of Christ, and he gives you a warning, and, and the more of Christ that he presents, the stronger the warning becomes. And that only makes sense to me. I, I think that's the way that I would do it. You know, if I'm going to keep exalting Christ, it, it wouldn't be like the warnings would get less. It would be like the more I know about Christ, the more serious it becomes. You know, I tell my church all the time, I told them over the years, I said, church is a dangerous place. It's a dangerous place because, because you hear things, and once you begin, once you hear them and you get taught things clearly, that you become responsible. You become responsible to those things that you hear. Um, you're obligated, in a sense, to, to, to live out the Christian life based on what you've heard. So I, I would think that uh, the exaltations of Christ, they're just a, a glorious background for this encouragement that the writer is giving to them. And I want to say once again, I, I'll probably say it uh, many times, especially when we get to each one of these warnings, that if you're living for Christ right now, today, the warnings won't affect you. They're not, they're not going to hurt you in any way. You're not, you're not going to feel like, oh no, you know, maybe I lost my salvation or I'm not saved. You would never feel that way. You would go, yep, that's exactly right. You know, that's exactly what, that, that, that's right. I, don't, I, I, I do need to give earnest heed to the things of Christ. I don't want to drift away. That, that's the way I read it. You know, when I come to, to one of the warnings, I, I think that's the right way. That, that they ought to be a great encouragement because we know that the thrust of the warning does not represent our life. It doesn't represent our lifestyle. It doesn't represent the direction of our life. And rather than being a source of discouragement, they become a source of great encouragement. Now, I say that because I've taught this for a long time in my church, and that's the impact that these warnings have had on my people, is that they, they have come to see them as a, a, a great blessing, as a what I would consider to be an evidence of the fact that they were really following Christ and that they love Christ. Uh, some, somebody's going to say, well, what if they do describe my life and how I actually live? Well, then the answer is simple. Then you need to heed the warning. You need to heed the instruction that, that this writer is giving to you. Uh, you know, I, I would say that if you're really a committed Christian, this warning, you, you shouldn't have to say that. But if for some reason they do apply to you, then you need to heed it. That's what the warning's for. If it says, slow down, curve ahead, you better slow down, there's a curve ahead. And it doesn't tell you what the consequences are going to be if you go too fast around that curve. You can use your imagination about that. I think anybody who loves somebody will always warn them of the inherent dangers that they know that exist in their life. Uh, you know, I have a granddaughter and she's getting ready to go to college. She'll graduate from high school this year and she's going to get ready to go to college. And the other day uh, I took her and my wife out to eat. And uh, we, we and the whole time that we were in the... Uh, uh, it took us about uh, probably uh, almost a half hour to get to where we were going, a half hour to come back. And the whole time that we were together, about where were you eating, and, and uh, I was talking to her about going to college, uh, and all the things that were involved, and the temptations, and the issues that she was going to face, and how she had to be grounded in certain things. You know, I was just talking about about those things in a, in a very simple way that 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 she could understand. And so, uh, one of the one of the, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, there was this family in my church that went to a particular beach for a vacation. Uh, it's a place called Edisto Beach in, uh, on the coast here in South Carolina where I live. And, uh, and uh, it has a very, very strong riptide. It has a very strong undercurrent to it. Uh, in fact, the beach is actually eroding away and they have all these, uh, uh, you know, these um, uh, rock piles that they put up to, to you know, to, to, to kind of break some of that. And so 
one of their daughters, unfortunately, got caught in this powerful and undertow. And, and if you've ever been in one of those, you understand that you can't fight it. It's too strong and it will, it will exhaust you. You will drown. Every year at this beach, they have two or three people that drown because of the undertow, because of the riptide. They got signs up all over the place, you know, strong undertow, riptide. There are no lifeguards to run in and get somebody. And most people don't take a, a you know, something out there. Uh, they don't take a, a, a life jacket or something to throw somebody. And so she got caught in this riptide. And all of a sudden her parents and her sister realize that she's out there and she can't get back in. Best thing to do is just, just to float down with it and it will eventually give out. And, and, and uh, man, next thing I know, they go tearing out there. I've heard the story a couple times. And they are, they are just, and they get caught in it. And the wife, the mother of the, the child, she looked, she got beat up. When she got to church, the next time that, when they came to church that weekend, she had bruises all over her face. The, the young girl had bruises all over her where they, had, where the, 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 just the struggle that they had was so strong. And uh, they, barely, they, 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 they barely made it back. And, uh, and you know what happened? You want to know what happened? You, you want to know what the point of that illustration is? Is that they didn't heed the warnings. They didn't listen. They didn't pay attention to the sign. I guarantee you when they go down there next time, they go down there every year, when they go down there next time, that they're not going to get caught in the riptide. They're not going to go out too far. They're not going to just drift out there. And uh, so the warnings are there not to harm you, but to help you. I think it ought to be recognized that even though the gospel calls on the unbeliever to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved, that once someone is saved, it then calls on that believer to persevere in the faith, to persevere in the things of God. And so I think the issue is really very simple. It's, it's essential that a believer's behavior matches what the gospel requires of those who believe. Everybody, everyone has reasonable and legitimate expectations of other people uh, who serve in various capacities. I, I have expectations of my wife. My wife has expectations of me. I have, I have expectations of uh, the men in my church that are the elders. I, I, I just have expectations of them, of, of how they're going to live, of how they're going to serve. They have expectations of me. They're not unreasonable. They're, they're the right expectations. They're good expectations. Everyone, let's take for instance, if a policeman stopped somebody for speeding, but he was so drunk that he, that, that he couldn't write the ticket out, then that individual would find that very, very difficult to accept. Why? Why would he find that to be difficult to accept? Because there are certain expectations. There's a job description of a, of a police officer, and it's not being drunk on the job. It, it would, it's, it's, a, it's not an unreasonable expectation at all. It's simply that's his behavior is not consistent with what he says that he is. He says he's a police officer, he's got a uniform on, he's driving a car, he's got a gun on his belt, you know? He's got a, he's got a badge that he's wearing, and I have ex certain expectations for him. You have expectations for those people. And so, he's not what he represented himself to be. His behavior did not match his job description. And if, if, if that happened to you, and that, and that officer was, was drunk when he stopped you, you would be upset and angry. And, 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 and uh, you would have a case where you could, you could go and get something suspended, maybe. I mean, how would a parent feel if their child's school teacher was cursing the, t cursing the children and treating them harshly in the classroom? Well, I'd be running down to the school. I'd say, you know, that, that's not, a, a teacher can't be cursing our kids. A teacher can't be in the classroom 
cursing and, and treating them harshly, uh, you know, saying ugly things to them, because that's not, that's not the expectation that we have of their job description. They're, they're to be teaching them. They're to be an example of that, of that person. So everybody who has a job is normally given a job description that defines what it is, what the expectations of their employer is, and how they are, how they are to do their work, how they're, uh, uh, you know, how they are to uh, to handle certain situations. I, I used to own an architectural firm, and uh, or be a, a a partner in an architectural firm, and we had a business plan. I mean, it was a thick manual. It was probably that thick of 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 how we were going to run our business, of the expectations that we had of our employers, uh, our employees, of how we were going to look for work, uh, of a, a certain profit level that we wanted to have, all of those kind of things that were literally very essential. So what I'm saying to you is that expectations are just a normal part of life. And God has expectations of me. I'm a pastor, you know. I, I'm a I'm a teacher. I'm a I'm a dean. I'm a professor. I, there, everybody that 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 I work with, they have expectations of me. Um, rightfully so. I have expectations of them. I have expectations of William, and and uh, and uh, and and what he's going to do as a student, how he's going to. How he's going to do his work. I, I have expectations of you as a student. I don't send me something sloppy. Don't just wait until Saturday night, you know, to 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 write your paper and send it in. You know, just go out there on the internet and get a couple places and put it down. I'm not going to give you a good grade. You you might want to just take another class. If, if I'm not going to give you a degree, you're going to have to earn the degree. And you're going to have to demonstrate to me and to other people that you're willing to do the work so that you can get the degree. If, 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 if everybody that we, everybody that was a student, if we allowed them just to get away with just being, uh, you know, negligent in their work and negligent in their test and, and not making good grades, and, 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 but we just gave them good grades anyway, then your degree wouldn't mean anything. The harder it is for you, the more your degree means to you. And I'm here, my goal is to press you into excellence in the ministry. And hopefully that will come out in some of the comments that I make on your papers. Uh, I guarantee you, I can guarantee you right now, that there will be students that will hand in papers uh, this semester to me on Hebrews and they haven't even read the syllabus. They haven't read the fact that I don't want them to use I and me and we and you and they and all these personal pronouns. We're not having a nice conversation. It's a research paper. It's a technical paper. I, I guarantee you that I'll, have to, that I'll have to write something down. I'll have to kind of correct all of that, lower the grade, why? Because somebody's not paying attention. You can't be in the ministry. Let me back, back up. You should not be in the ministry if you don't understand what excellence in the ministry requires of you and in your life. I mean, why, why should God's expectations for His children be any different than the expectations that we have as citizens and I mean, I, you know what? I mean, why should why should, why do we think that God's expectations are unreasonable? Why should somebody ever feel that God is unfair because He desires that His children's behavior would reflect Him? I don't I I don't think that's unreasonable. If I'm going to call myself a Christian, then I want to live like a Christian. And everybody that calls on the name of Christ that doesn't live like Christ, it's, it's a demeaning thing to the person of Christ for them to do that. As a pastor, I, I represent the church I serve. I'm, I'm an official representative of my church. 
and and all of my members, all, all of the members of, of our church, they have very real, legitimate expectations of me. They have very real, legitimate expectations. They would be deeply embarrassed. They would be highly disappointed. They would be grieved if they, for some reason, heard that I was involved in pornography, watching X-rated movies, that every time that I went out in public that I got ugly. You know, I went to Walmart and I didn't like the fact that the lady at the counter was not uh, doing something right and I got mad and I got angry and I talked inappropriately and I said some things and I cursed at her and I'm, I'm, the, somebody saw me buying beer in one of the quick shops they have expectations. They're, I have expectations. And they're reasonable expectations. So why, why would we ever think that it's wrong for God to have expectations of our life? It's not. It's wrong. It would be wrong for God not to have expectations of our life. And so every member has spiritual expectations of me as their pastor. So what can be discerned so far is that the admonitions, the encouragements, and the warnings function as a necessary means for believers to persevere in their salvation. I want you to appreciate what I've just said here. That, that it's a necessary means. It's, if, 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 I, if, if I don't want any young kids to get near the pool, I'm going to put a, a fence up and I'm going to make sure they understand I don't want them to get near the pool. I don't want him to get close to the road. If my young granddaughter is, uh, she has a car and, and she drives, and, and I, I would say, Chelsea, you have, to, you, have to, you have to follow the speed limit signs. You, you have to, you, you, you know, yellow sign means it's a caution. You don't pass when there's a double yellow line. You know, that's not unreasonable. The, all that's going to do is protect her from having a wreck and from getting killed uh, at some point. So all these admonitions and warnings, I want you to appreciate, they function as one of God's primary means of getting you and I to persevere in, in our salvation. How many Christians do you know today? How many, if you're, let's say for instance that you're a pastor or you want to be a pastor, maybe, I don't, I'm not sure that most of my students are pastors, but let's just say that you are or are or, or you just a member of your church? I mean, how many people do you know that it's kind of obvious and evident to you that they are not persevering in the faith? They're just kind of wandering. They're just kind of loose. You know, they, they just they come when they want to. They don't come when they don't want to. You know, if they want to read the Bible, they read. You know, what, what, what's that? I, I don't know how to define all of that other than just that's bad. You know, that's certainly not what God wants for our life. So there's a lot to gain. There's a lot to lose by not heeding the warnings. And for the believer, it's, it's not a loss of salvation that's in focus here. And that's a major point because if you read a, a good number of the commentaries, you're, they're going to say, at some point, they're going to say that this, this war warning here, maybe not this one, but this one is talking about losing your salvation. We're, we're, we're not talking about losing salvation. This is really more of a book about sanctification. I mean, why would, why would, why would we think that we could lose our salvation? Just because we did something that was wrong? Just because we didn't persevere in a particular area? No, 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 no. I mean, if you don't understand the doctrine of salvation, then, then it will be an issue to you. To me, those people that promote that, to me there's something about the doctrine of eternal security that they don't understand. I would, I would say, and, and forgive me if you're a Pentecostal or holiness or church of God, I'm not, I'm not directing this at you, but I know that the majority of the doctrine, say, in a Pentecostal church, on the fact that you can lose your salvation, which I think is a very, uh, uh, that's, it, it's, it's not a proper doctrine from the scriptures that they base 
a lot of their doctrine on these warnings. I mean, we'll get to the warnings. I mean, we're going to go over each one of them in detail, but they base the fact that you can lose your salvation based on these, doc, uh, on these warnings, and I would say that the warnings have nothing to do with losing your salvation. They do have something to do with losing something. What that is, how to quantify that, I don't know. I'm not even going to try. The scriptures don't, don't try, and so I'm not going to try. But I know that there's something to lose. Why would you want to lose something? Why would you want to lose God's grace in your life? Why would you want to lose God's peace? Why would you want to lose personal rewards that are going to be compounded out into eternity? Well, it may be something about Christ that you don't understand. You know, you just, you're not in love with Jesus. He doesn't mean that much to you. And so you can just live indifferently and casually uh, as it relates to these things. And so I think a major part, these, these warnings are a scriptural way of identifying, uh, of identifying the reality and the genuineness of a, of, a, of a person's confession of Christ. And a major part of the privilege of being a follower of Christ is the, the, the specific responsibilities that go along with the Christian life. Uh, I, 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 it's a badge of honor to me. It should be a badge of honor to you if you're going to be in the ministry that you are a student of the Word of God. It's a badge of honor to study God's Word. It's not something that you can take lightly. If you wait to Saturday night to develop a message that you're going to speak the next day with a Sunday school class or a message at your church, shame on you. Shame on you. You've got the wrong priorities if you're just going to wait to the last minute to really be putting things together. I'm, I'm working on things, all kinds of things, classes that I'm teaching. Uh, it's just amazing. Uh, one, one of the other uh, online professors and me, um, he's done the majority of the work up to this point. We're developing a book that we're going to use as a textbook in, in the course here. We're going to use it as a textbook on it's going to sound crazy, how to study the Bible. Now, you would just think that in a seminary that that wouldn't really be an issue. That, that's a big issue. I mean, this, this book will probably uh, will be, of uh, these 8 and a half by 11 pages will probably be, just one side only, probably be 800 pages at least. At least 800 pages. Probably be a, uh, a three-semester course on how to study the Bible. And how, how, to, how, to, how to take the Word of God, how to teach it. You know, it's, there's so many people that just teach without any kind of passion at all. I had the I, I had to, I, I had the opportunity to go to a, a church a, a while back. It was a good while back. It was actually several years ago. And, and uh, I was just shocked. I mean, I really was just shocked that it was like the pastor was just passionless about what he was preaching. I mean, I mean, I, I, you would never find me falling asleep in a, in a church service, ever, or in a class. Uh, you know, when I go to Romania, I was over there a couple of weeks ago, and, uh, and uh, I sat through 10 hours of class every day. It was, it was, I, I didn't teach. I went for administrative reasons. And, uh, but the two guys that were teaching, the professors, they teach five hours at a time and five hours at a time. And I sat there, I took notes the whole time. I got my computer, I'm writing down, I'm taking notes. I'm doing, I mean, I've got just tons and tons and tons of notes. And I've got their notes to go along with it. And, uh, uh, man, I, I mean, we're studying God's Word. I was excited. We studied James and Nehemiah. Boy, uh, those are great great courses, the men that teach those, and they're online, uh, um, so you ought to be able to get one of those. And so these warnings um, and these admonitions, they, they're the way that God elicits faithfulness in, in, a, belie in, a, in a believer. Uh, um, I mean, 
I think what we're going to discern all as we make our way all the way through Hebrews is that somebody's somebody's personal assurance is directly related to their willingness to persevere in the faith. Remember I was telling you about one of the men in my church and uh, he struggles all the time? And he struggles with assurance. He's, he's just forever has struggled with assurance. He came out of a he came out of kind of a holiness background and where they just kept telling you you could lose your salvation and and uh, in that process uh, he just developed kind of a mindset that he could do something wrong, he could lose his salvation, you know. And and uh, and I keep telling him, I, I just just do what's right, you know. J just do what you know God wants you to do. And he's he's just he struggle with the assurance and and stuff. And and I'm I'm not struggling with assurance. I've been a Christian for 43 years. I do, I don't think that there's ever been a day in my life, ever in my Christian life, where I, where I ever thought for any reason that I wasn't saved. There have been plenty of times when I've done something that was wrong and something that I shouldn't do, but I was grounded enough, even from, uh, 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 you know, when I was an early Christian, I was still grounded enough to know that salvation was eternal. And and I've been living for Christ, and I, it, it, assurance is just not an issue for me. I'm going to die and go to heaven. It's just a done deal. It's over. It's complete. It, it's a fact. It's, it's, it's not something that's debatable. It doesn't just keep coming up in my mind. Uh, the enemy just, just cannot tip me in that particular area and get away with it. And so uh, there, there's something about persevering and running the race. And for those believers who do not take God's scriptural calling on their life seriously and who live in a way that's unbecoming to Christ, they're, they're never going to have assurance, ever. They're never going to have assurance in their life. If you're living in sin, if you're just, if you're not willing to commit your life to Christ, if you're not willing to do what He says, if you're not willing to be obedient, I, I, you're not going to have any assurance, and I'm probably not going to give you any. You know, um, so I think a lack of assurance is 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 very often a direct byproduct of an ungodly lifestyle. There's something in your life. There's some sin in your life. There's something in your life. That's not always the case. I understand that the scriptures are clear that at times that there are, that there, there's what they call a weak brother. I mean, the scriptures talk about uh, a weak brother. I, I've known weak brothers. Uh, we had a, a young man that, uh, that lived with us for uh, almost two years. And uh, he, he, was, um, uh, he was a weak brother, that's all I can say. He just, he, he just was a weak brother. I, uh, he was kind of weak mentally, and and uh, but he was a wonderful brother. I loved him to death. I mean, he was. Uh, we our family loved him. He was a he was a great guy, but he just struggled in some areas at times. Paul talked about the relationship between his behavior and his assurance in Second Timothy. He said, "I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith." Well. What does that mean? Well, that means he's fought the good fight, he finished the race, he's kept the faith. And he says, finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness. He, un he, he had this direct association between how he lived and his assurance. He said, God has laid up for me a crown of righteousness in his life. Paul's words reveal that there's this connection between his life and his assurance. There's fought the good fight, finished the race, kept the faith, and a crown of righteousness, and he was confident that he had lived in a way that exalted the person of Christ. I think a problem that a lot of Christians have is that they only think of salvation in the past tense. I was saved. We were saved at some point in time. But the New Testament never stops there. Salvation is portrayed as being threefold. We have been saved, we are being saved. We will be saved. There are three different aspects to it. Uh, you know, I think we would use different words. We would use words like salvation, sanctification, and glorification. Okay, those would be kind of the biblical terms that in some way would differentiate between these three things that are happening 
are going to happen in our life relative to salvation. There are a lot of people who claim salvation, but they have no perseverance in the things related to God. They, they just simply do not have any perseverance in, in, in the things of God. They don't live in a, in a way that exalts the person of Christ. And all that they've done is that they have embraced the past tense of salvation. They just embrace it. Well, I got saved back then. But there's nothing in their life today to reflect that that salvation was even real or meaningful in their life. They've just embraced an event. You know, when my kids were growing up, uh, and, and we were very evangelistic with them uh, just from a very early age when we taught them the scriptures, but I told all of them, every single one of them, I said, you know, you can say, you can make a profession of Christ, you can confess Christ, at this point in your life if you want to, but there's going to come a time in your life where God is going to test the reality of what it is that you say that you have. He is going to test. He already knows whether your salvation is real or whether it's not real. You, you're the one. The reason He's going to test it is so that you can know whether your salvation is real or whether it's not. And so... The people who've only embraced the past tense of salvation, but they've not embraced the present and they've not embraced the future aspect of salvation, these are individuals, I think, that are, they, they are for, forfeiting a very crucial element of, of biblical teaching that has practical consequences of just tremendous importance and significance. You, you cannot leave... You know, I'm, you know, in my Christian life personally, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about, about what's going to happen in the future and, and about going to heaven. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I just, I'm not afraid. I, I don't, I'm not afraid of some of the places that the Lord's going to allow me to go. I'm going to go to some dangerous places for Christians. Um... Uh, I don't know what's going to happen. I, I really don't. I mean, I just don't know what's going to happen. I, I hope everything will work out great. But at this point in my life, I'm not afraid. I've been through cancer twice. And one of the things that all of that, you know, it's one thing to have it the first time. It's another thing for you to sit in front of the doctor and he says it's come back much more aggressively the second time. And you kind of live with it every day, you know, it's, it's, it's like, it's systemic, it's something that doesn't go away. But what I learned in all that, and I don't mean this arrogantly, it's just, it was just something that God helped me with as I went through it. It was kind of interesting, I had three other people in my church that we all kind of got cancer at the same time, and, and one of them died, and the other, and, and the other two survived. Uh, and, and they're doing fine, and I, and I, I believe I'm doing fine. And, but I, I just I reached a place in my life where I knew that I really wasn't afraid to die. You know, it, I, I didn't want to. I have a family, I have a wife, I have grandkids. I, I want to watch them grow up. I, it won't be long. We were talking last night about it. It'd be four or five years and my granddaughter be married. And we'll have some, I'll be a great grandfather, you know. I, I'm kind of excited about that if I, if I live that long. But I wasn't afraid. You know, when I, I got faced with that and I got faced with the, what could happen, it was like, hey, my, I, I don't have a salvation that just happened then and this is going on now. There's something, there, there's a salvation out there later and, and I, my hope is in that. You know, if I didn't have any hope for the future, I wouldn't be teaching this class. I wouldn't even be in church. I wouldn't even be a Christian if I had no hope. It's just be a nice guy and, and live out, you know, do some good things. I wouldn't do that. So, hopefully you won't either. Hopefully you won't either. All right, we're, gonna, we're going to uh, stop there, and we'll take up in our fourth lesson here on page 19. Thank you.